This is lecture 24 on the second part of the brain and the functional anatomy of the brain. Picking up where we left off from lecture 23, we'll go into the dicephalon. Remember that the dicephalon connects the brain stem to the cerebral hemispheres and contains critically important structures such as the hypothalamus. It consists of three distinct regions. The epithalamus, which is going to form the roof of the third ventricle and contains the choroid plexus. The thalamus, which is going to be the main central connecting station of the brain. And then the hypothalamus, which is a very complex and essential tissue that's going to connect inferiorly with the pituitary gland and serve a multitude of functions. We'll start with the epithalamus, which is going to form the roof of the third ventricle and contain the choroid plexus. It also contains an endocrine organ called the pineal gland. The pineal gland lies in the posterior inferior portion of it, and it secretes a compound called melatonin that we'll talk about if you're taking 178. Melatonin is an important hormone in the regulation of day and night cycles. This also helps to regulate female menstrual cycle hormones as well. Here we can see the dicephalon. We can see where the uh, epithalamus is going to be at the very top as it extends back. Remember in the posterior aspect of the epithalamus would be the pineal gland that we can see in the very back of the uh, epithalamus and the back of the dicephalon. The thalamus is going to be a central egg-shaped body that surrounds the third ventricle. It is important an important switching and relay station for sensory and motor signals, and it also acts as a filter to limit which sensory signals proceed to the primary sensory cortex in the cerebrum. It contains a complex arrangement of thalamic nuclei, including the lateral and medial geniculate nucleus. Remember that ascending information is sensory and descending information is motor. The lateral geniculate nucleus is going to pr uh, project visual information from the eyes to the occipital lobe. The medial is going to deal with auditory information and transfer auditory information from the cochlear nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve, to the temporal lobe in the brain. Here we can see the thalamus uh, with the rest of the dicephalon removed, and we can see examples of where that lateral and medial geniculate nuclei are as it would relay itself through. And it should make sense that the lateral geniculate nucleus is an extension effectively of the optic chiasm and the optic track. And the medial geniculate nucleus would actually extend out laterally a little bit more. It's medial simply because it's on the inside, but it's going to branch up and around and continue through the lateral portion of the head. This is a simple diagram that you don't need to memorize, but is useful for understanding the importance of the thalamus and how it relates to the actual cerebral cortex. Remember that the thalamus is a relay station and it has several other nuclei that project fibers to specific regions of the brain. This is simply showing you the thalamus and where it would connect to those portions of the brain because the thalamus itself is like a mini brain inside of it because it's two egg shaped um, lobes inside. So the left portion of the thalamus is going to deal with the left side of the brain and the right side, the right side. The final portion of the dicephalon is the hypothalamus. It is an extremely complex and essential tissue that connects inferiorly with the pituitary gland via a stalk-like infundibulum. It has many functions um, and it can be stimulated by sensory information from the cerebrum, brainstem, and spinal cord changes in the composition of the cerebral spinal fluid and interstitial fluid, and then chemicals in the circulating blood. Blood rapidly enters the hypothalamus via the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system because this area lacks a blood-brain barrier. Now the hypothalamus itself has several nuclei. It has autonomic centers, suprachiastic nuclei, and hormonal centers. The autonomic centers are going to control cardiovascular and vasomotor centers of the medulla oblongata. It regulates body temperature by coordinating adjustments in blood flow and sweat gland activity. It can also work in conjunction with the GI tract, controlling portions of the enteric nervous system and aid in digestion. The suprachiastic nuclei is going to help to coordinate day and night cycles of activity and inactivity. It does this in conjunction with the pineal gland as well. Finally, it's going to have hormonal centers, and the hormonal centers are going to secrete different chemical messengers to the anterior pituitary gland and produce two hormones released at the posterior pituitary. 
We'll talk more about the hormonal activities when we get to the endocrine system. So beyond just many of the endocrine functions, the hypothalamus can control the circadian rhythms, the day and night cycles, and it's gonna coordinate voluntary and autonomic functions, such as your flight or, uh, fight or flight response. It additionally is going to have many other behavioral drives. It's gonna deal with your thirst and hunger, and it is a center of subconscious motor patterns associated with rage, pleasure, and sexual arousal. Some supporting structures for the hypothalamus would of course be the infundibulum and the mammillary bodies. The infundibulum is simply a stock, because infundibulum itself means funnel, and it's a stock that is going to connect the hypothalamus to the actual pituitary gland. Inside is going to be a number of blood vessels, including a portal system that we'll talk about later. Mammillary bodies are gonna be extensions of the actual hypothalamus that control the feeding reflexes, such as licking and swallowing. They're very active in infants. Here we can see a diagram of the hypothalamus, including many of its centers. You don't need to memorize where these centers are. It's just giving you kind of uh, the overall structure and reminding you what it does. So remember that it has autonomic centers. It deals with body temperature, night and day cycles, hormonal centers, and those hormonal centers are gonna link up via the infundibulum to the actual uh, pituitary gland. You can see the mammillary bodies in the posterior aspect of the hypothalamus. Moving out from the dicephalon, but before we get to the cerebrum, we're gonna talk about an, a border of gray and white matter called the limbic system. A, it is a purely functional, but not anatomically distinct system. And here, nuclei are found in the cerebrum, dicephalon, and uh, mesonephalon. This area is actually going to be associated primarily with different emotional states. It's going to link the conscious intellectual functions of the cerebral cortex with the unconscious functions of the autonomic nervous system and brainstem. And it's going to be greatly involved in memory storage and retrieval and affects motivation. Now, like I said before, this is a border system. So there are gonna be portions of the limbic system that are gonna be in the cerebral, and then portions that are in the dicephalon. The cerebral components are the hippocampus, the amygdaloid body, and the parahippocampal or cingulate gyri. The dicephalon components are the anterior thalamus, hypothalamic nuclei, and the mammillary body. Here we can see some of the different structures. The hippocampus has a resemblance to a seahorse with its curved-like structure. It's an important uh, structure in storage and retrieval of long-term memories. The amygdaloid body is an interface between the limbic system, cerebrum, and sensory system. So it links all these systems together and links emotions with specific memories. It works with the hypothalamus in the fight or flight or autonomic responses. The dicephalon has a few components. The anterior thalamus is a relay station. The hypothalamic nuclei itself is the emotional area. There's rage, fear, pain, sexual arousal, and pleasure. And this area is going to produce heightened alertness and excitement, uh, as well as generalized lethargy and sleep feelings. Finally, the mammillary body, which we talked about a little bit already in the hypothalamus, is going to deal with feeding reflexes like chewing, licking, and swallowing. Going through the different components again, the hippocampus, remember, has an elongated nucleus, and it comes from the name comes from its resemblance to a seahorse. It is important in learning uh, and involved in the storage and retrieval of long-term memories. A fornix is simply going to be the connecting portion that connects the hippocampus with the hypothalamus. It's a tract of white matter, so it's just a connecting relay portion. The amygdaloid body of the limbic lobe is gonna act, like I said, as an interface among the limbic system, cerebrum, and sensory systems. It's going to help to regulate your heart rate and to control the fight or flight response. And this works in conjunction with the hypothalamus and links emotions with specific memories. The hypothalamic nuclei is going to be the boundary between the nuclei and it's going to deal with different emotional areas for rage, fear, pain, sexual arousal, and pleasure. The areas also produce that heightened alertness like I talked about. Moving back out from the limbic system, we will talk about the largest region of the brain, the cerebrum. And this contains two hemispheres, the right and the left. And the cerebrum is the center of conscious thought process and all intellectual function. It processes somatic sensory and motor information and makes decisions about subsequent actions. 
A hallmark of Homo sapiens is how much cerebrum has grown relative to other brain areas. We have a lot of cerebrum. The lobes of the cerebrum are named for their overlying bones of the skull, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Now some general facts about the cerebrum and the cerebral hemispheres is that each hemisphere receives sensory information from the opposite side of the body and sends motor information to that. So for example, this left side of the brain actually is going to feel and control the right side of the body and vice versa as far as for the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and feels everything from there. This is a form of decusation or crossing over. Now, the crossing over occurs in the brainstem and spinal cord. It has no known functional significance. We don't know why it exists this way. The corpus callosum is one prominent place in the actual brain where the decusation occurs between the hemispheres, where we have a crossing over of information from the hemispheres. Now, the hemispheres may look identical and have many similar functions, but still have important differences. Other important structures of the brain actually deal with many of the grooves that exist on its surface. One of the primary ones is called the central sulcus. The central sulcus is a deep groove that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. On the frontal lobe side, the precentral gyrus, it deals with motor, the motor signals in the body. It's the motor cortex. The postcentral gyrus, or the portion of the central sulcus that's on the parietal lobe, is going to deal with sensory information and contains the primary sensory cortex. The lateral sulcus is going to be another groove. This is nearly horizontal and separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. The parieto occipital sulcus is going to be visible on the medial surface and it simply separates the parietal from the occipital. Here we can see the different lobes separated out with the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. We have the lateral sulcus that's going to be a nice nearly horizontal groove separating the temporal lobe from the others. And of course we have the, occipital, the parieto occipital groove that is going to divide those. Take note of the central sulcus and the highlighted portions. The central sulcus will divide the frontal and parietal lobes as stated. The precentral gyrus, which is highlighted in red, is actually going to deal with motor signals. It is the primary motor cortex that sends motor commands throughout the multitude of your body. The postcentral gyrus is sensory. It is going to receive sensory information throughout, from all of the signals throughout your body. Here we can see a dividing portion to where we can actually see a better view of the parieto occipital sulcus where it actually separates the parietal and occipital lobe. So now that we've talked about some of the major areas of the brain structurally, these are gonna be some of the functional areas of the cerebral cortex. You can take note of the motor cortex that we've already discussed found in the precentral gyrus. That's going to deal with all of the different voluntary motor commands that you deal with. Sensory cortex is gonna be in that postcentral gyrus just back there. This receives general somatic sensory information, but not from the special senses, really just from the body. It has sensations of touch, pressure, pain, temperature, proprioception, which is your body's awareness in space, and your body projects this information here in the sensory cortex, and you're made aware of it. There is the gustatory cortex that is found within the postcentral gyrus, as it is labeled, and this is going to deal with uh, taste. Gustation is taste. The olfactory cortex is found in the temporal lobe. And inside this is going to deal with the sense of smell. Primary, if we're looking towards the occipital lobe, we can see the primary visual cortex. This is going to project visual images via neurons from the optic chiasm and the eyes where, they're, where they are actually filtered through the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Moving back to the temporal lobe, we'll see the primary auditory cortex. This is going to receive information via the middle, uh, medial geniculate nucleus from the thalamus and uh, help you actually transmit auditory information for interpretation. There are also different association areas. We have the auditory association area that is going to recognize sounds and uh, joins with other areas to respond and the visual association area. This is going to monitor the visual cortex activity and interprets the activity of different symbols so you understand what letters look like. Um, you are going to also be able to move those symbols together to form words. Finally, there are integrative areas. These are involved in complex higher learning processes such as speech, 
writing and mathematics. We have Broca's area known as the speech center. This is responsible for speech production and includes control of speech related breathing to where you learn how to breathe within how you're talking. If we have lesions to this area it can result in an inability to convert thoughts into meaningful sounds. And what happens is that the articulators like the tongue, vocal folds, jaw, lips have difficulty forming the right patterns to make meaningful words and sentences. This generally happens more when they're trying to do it voluntarily and exclamations often come out perfectly correct. Don't drop that where you actually have to process more of what you need to think. Some patients also have some reading and writing difficulties, but never as severe as the speech problems. So this is going to be a form of aphasia. Uh, there is the general interpretive area or Wernick's area that we have. This allows you to recognize spoken words and understand language and also respond accordingly. Damage here can result in an inability to recognize speech and respond accordingly. It also plays a role in personality and access to complex visual and auditory memories. And finally, we have the prefrontal cortex. The most anterior portion of the cerebral hemispheres, and this area is responsible for complex and abstract intellectual function. One of the main things is predicting consequences of action. This is actually the thing that develops later in life. So it's going to develop as we get older and older. It's why as we get older, we tend to be a little bit better about planning for the future.